right. Hey, Omaha, Millard, Fremont, glad you guys are here tonight at all of our campuses. Uh, yes, perfect. Thank you. These will make sense in a moment. Don't worry. Uh, would you guys give me a loud, just like on your feet, standing ovation for Eric Vidlack really quick. He's a friend of mine. Eric, come on up here. Yes, he deserves it. He's the man. Listen, I, I got to tell you guys, uh, Eric, I got to go on the Mexico mission trip last spring with you, Eric, and uh, it was a lot of fun. I, uh, I learned a lot from you. Um, you know, you really, you, you taught me how to use a hammer. I mean, it was, uh, it was amazing. I, I thought I could never figure it out, but you did. So Eric is a miracle worker, just so you know. Uh, but... I, we wanted to bring Eric out here tonight for all the students uh, because we know some of you, maybe you've been thinking about going on the Mexico trip possibly. Uh, some of you, you're thinking, you know, middle school, you're thinking, man, maybe I should try and get my parents to go with me. High school students, you can go without your parents uh, because I'm there and I know a lot about safety. No, that's not true. You, you can come without your parents because Eric will be there and he will guide us to not make terrible mistakes. Uh, Eric, because of you, I did not lose one finger while I was out there at Mexico. So thank you. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Yes. Eric, I just want to ask you tonight a little bit about Mexico so they can kind of hear about this trip, why we go every year as a church. Uh, last year was my first experience along with Andrew Randolph. Uh, we both got to go. And, uh, you know, I just want to ask you, how, how many times have you been to Mexico on this trip? Um, the one I went with you would have been three. Three? So the, nice. This one will be my fourth one. Nice. Um, what are... You know, what are some of the things that we do while we're on this trip? From the get-go? From the yeah, get-go? Yeah, yeah, you know, what, what's, well, a, what's an average trip look like? Well, we fly out to uh, Arizona, and we hang out at a church out there and go shopping for the family, buy some supplies for them. Yeah. And we eat In-N-Out Burger. In-N-Out Burger. Uh, bonus. play volleyball, basketball. Yeah. It looks like Village Point out there. There's lights, there's palm trees, there's... Oh, yeah. There's so much. It's a, it's a really neat campus. It's a nice church. Yeah. I mean, Mark is here tonight. You can tell him, hey, let's build a volleyball and basketball court. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. We want next steps. Yeah. All right. Um, you know, then we get up at 4.30 in the morning on Saturday, drive to Mexico, three-hour drive-ish. Yeah. Um, you know, s- drop off our supplies and head straight to the job site and start... Uh, Start mixing concrete by hand. Everything we do is all by hand. Um, so it's, it's hard work, but it's very rewarding. And I, I would go every weekend if I could, but it's just a really, really neat thing to, to do and to be a part of. And to, you know, I, I already knew Andrew and Alex before, but then going on this trip, you kind of just get that bond that's, you, that you always will have now, you know. You can say it, Eric. You can say that we're best friends now. I, I don't mind you telling the world. Uh, you know, and Eric, you can also admit to everyone that I'm your favorite ahead of Andrew. Is Andrew here right now? Uh, he's at Fremont. Oh, okay, He's at then. Fremont. Yes, 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 you are. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry. Scott, you might want to edit that out. Andrew might cry. Whoops. That's all right. The truth, the truth hurts, but it needed to come out. Uh, would you say... Anyone is capable of coming and helping in some way on this trip? Yeah, of course. There's so many different places to serve or do. Or, I mean, even if you've never used a saw or a hammer, I mean, you could play with the kids. And, yeah. you know, the first time I went, Anna and Elise went, and we did, they did a Bible study with the kids. And, you know, it's, it, it's just really, really rewarding to go and, and to see and be a part of it, I think, yes. and to show you know, God's love and, you know, walk the walk that Jesus wants us to walk and show them that, you know, that they're loved and they're not forgotten about. And it's just a really, really neat thing to do. So, yeah, definitely. And Eric, I really appreciate you coming and not mentioning that I got the van stuck three times while I, on this trip. I was going to mention that. I really And I was going to get the phone, the pictures <laughs> off my phone to show everybody, but I forgot. <laughs> There's no pictures. Get rid of those, Eric. We don't want to see those. Nobody wants to see those. No, nobody <laughs> wants to see those, you guys. Uh, Eric, if you could pick an all-time maybe favorite moment or memory from going to Mexico besides me getting one of the vans stuck, uh, what would you pick? 
Um, I would probably say the second, my second trip was an all men's one that we went on and, and Mitch let me present the keys to the family and that was really neat and I just wish I knew Spanish and, or recorded it because she talked for 10 minutes in Spanish but no one translated it and I'd never seen tears. They didn't go down her face and they f fell and never hit her body. They were falling out like a cartoon. <laughs> and when we got done, the Amor guy's like, I don't know what she said, but she's very grateful. I'm like, well, yeah, that's obvious, but I would have liked to know what she said, you know? It might have. So maybe something that'd be helpful is uh, any high school students taking Spanish classes right now? You guys should all definitely come. <laughs> all right? Get signed up, get registered. Uh, it, it is just an incredible trip. Um, you know, I, I'll tell you what, it, it's a trip where you bond and you make new friendships. Uh, you know, I, I liked Eric before. Afterwards, Eric and I were best friends. I mean, even though he made fun of me for getting the van stuck. I mean, it's fine. Four times. Four times. Four times, yeah, yep. Well, Eric, uh, I just want to, I kind of wanted to show the kids how much you taught me. And uh, I wanted to prove that I, uh, really, I, I'm a man among men. So I, I'd like to challenge you now, if you'll accept my challenge to a hammer contest. Would you accept that challenge? I will accept. Let's do this, Eric. Let's do this. You can, uh, you can cheer for your favorite. Don't worry. If it's Eric, it won't hurt my feelings. That's fine. All right. What do you think, Eric? Uh, one nail each or two nails each? You think you can get two nails in before I get one in? Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. I've been practicing, Eric. I know a lot about leverage. And uh, yeah, that's solid right there. All right. Now, what you want to do is uh, you want to hold it like that, right, Eric? No, not like that. Not like that. All right. You guys, you guys count it down out there. Three, two, one. Let us know when to go. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's solid. Come on, baby. I'm through. Did you get two done already? Why? Well, I, I was joking, man. Gosh. I thought I was right with you. All right. Give Eric a hand, you guys. Man. I really was, I was actually trying. Gosh. Yeah, sure. We, we don't want anybody to get stabbed. You got both those already? Jeez, I'm a man, oh, I'm so strong, gosh, all right, yep, uh, that's good, watch out for that nail right there, all right, you guys, give Eric a hand, man, <laughs> thanks for coming out, man, appreciate it, all right, okay, I, I swear, guys, I'm better than that, I, I know I can do better than that. I just need another chance. We'll bring Eric back some week after I practice a little bit more. Stop being a silly goose. Okay, I'll try. I'll try. All right. Uh, so we are, we are two weeks left in our uh, road trip through the Bible, this series we've been going through. And so tonight, uh, you know, we're talking a lot about, you know, we got this service opportunity coming up on Saturday uh, where, you know, hopefully we get a bunch of you to come out and just serve together, uh, youth leaders, students, all of us together out there, um, Andrew, myself, uh, Adam, Jamie, we're all going to be out there. We want you guys to come with us um, because we do these things because we want to go and be the church. I think so often when we think of the church, we just think, man, it's a place where I go and I sit for an hour on Sunday, or I just sit for an hour on Wednesday night, and that's it. That is what the church is all about. But there's more to the church than that, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're looking at the book of Acts. So if you got your Bibles, you can open up with us. We're going to be looking at Acts chapter 2, uh, chapter 1, right there in the beginning of the church. Okay, so let me set this up for you. Right after Jesus has died and risen from the grave, and he's hanging out with his disciples. Eventually, he says, it's better for me to leave so that the Holy Spirit can come. And that will be the beginning of the church. And he wasn't talking about this building. 
or Fremont's building or Millard's building. That's just a building. That's not the church. The church is the people. And so I want you to see here the beginning of the church. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Let me read this for you. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. At this time, Jesus, he was gone already. He had left them. And so they were hanging out, meeting, and suddenly there was a sound from heaven like roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. This is the beginning of the church when the Holy Spirit comes. God living inside of us. We talk about this idea a lot and it's kind of a hard idea to wrap our minds around, but I want you to know that the Bible talks about when you give your life to Jesus, it says, be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit. They go hand in hand together. So if you've given your life to Jesus, if you've made that public confession of faith, if you've been baptized, you can be confident in the fact that you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Now, right after you're baptized, you you might feel, you know, a little different, but you might not notice anything. For me, when I got baptized very young, I didn't really notice a difference in my life. I didn't feel dramatically changed. But over time, I started to see how the Holy Spirit was working and making my life different. Because when I look back at who I was when I got baptized, To now, I can see that the Holy Spirit has been transforming me. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He slowly walks along with us and nudges us in the direction of being more like God. You know, some of you, uh, you know, maybe you've wrestled with this in the past, wondering, man, I I feel like I can't hear God. I I just wanna, I wanna hear him. I wanna know he's real. I wanna hear him speak into my life. It's hard to have that confidence at times that he is there living inside of us. But what we see in the early church, we see the Holy Spirit working and working powerfully. The early church was connected in a powerful way. I want you to see what the early church looked like. Acts chapter two, verse 42. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching So they'd get together just like we are. They'd get together and and they would listen to a message about the Bible. They would learn God's word, okay, from these apostles, from these preachers, okay? They'd get together, listen to teaching. They were devoted to fellowship. Fellowship is just hanging out, having fun. That's why a lot of you, you'll come early and you'll play nine square out there or, you know, you'll come on one of our youth trips and that's fellowship, You'll hang out all weekend at Oasis and uh, we'll have a ton of fun together. And that's fellowship. That's what God wants the church to be. He wants it to be a place where people feel like they belong, where they have friends, where they're connected. And to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. That's why, you know, we have these pizza nights or we have these first Wednesday nights or we have snacks or anything we do. We want to share a meal together. We want to share, even if it's just having a fruit snack and and talking about, you know, how school is going or how life has been lately. Just having moments to share while eating together. Some of you high school students, I, I know there's a group of you that you will go every Wednesday and you'll hang out at Raising Cane's after, okay? Some of you guys, I know you'll do that. That's awesome. That's what the church is supposed to do. We're supposed to hang out. We're supposed to have fun and share meals together. And to prayer. I think that's one that we probably struggle with. Sure, we pray maybe here on Wednesday or Sunday mornings, but are are we really praying together with our friends that go to Elevate? Are we really getting together and, and making it an effort to pray together? A deep sense of awe came over them all and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and they shared their meals with great joy and generosity. Some of you guys, you do that every week. 
You're going to a small group. High school students, when you go to a small group, there's typically some kind of meal or snack there. You're sharing together. You're studying God's word. You're praying together. That's awesome. Middle school students, you're starting to get that that taste of what a small group, what community is like here on Wednesdays. You're hanging out. You're studying deeper into God's word. And you have that fellowship and time together. That's why we do all these things. We don't just do these things for no reason at all. What we're doing, we're trying to be like the church at the very beginning, the Acts 2 church. That's what we want to look like here at Elevate and Stonebridge as a whole. We want to be the church the way God intended it to be. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals in great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Ultimately, that's the goal of why we do church, why we get together and we study scripture and we share meals and we have fellowship so more people will be able to come into God's kingdom. We wanna create a community here that draws people in. We've seen that. We've seen it happening. You've seen your friends who are outside of the church. You've seen them look in at what you have, the relationships here, and they want to have what you have. They've asked you about it. They've said, yeah, I want to come check that out sometime. I want to be a part of that. I want to belong. That's what community is all about, belonging. And it's about bringing as many people along with you as you can. So here's what I would challenge you. Some of you, you look at this and it's just become your social club. It's just for you and your little group of church friends and you don't invite, you don't go out of your way to bring other people in. There are kids in this room that feel like they're just attending because there's little cliques, there's little groups here and at Fremont and at Millard of people that think, oh, we're just gonna stick together. It's just us. It's just our group of seniors or juniors. We go and we hang out together, but we don't bring anyone else in with us. That's not what the church is supposed to look like. The church is supposed to be a place where anyone and everyone can find a place to belong. So I would just challenge us as a student ministry to start looking at how we're living our lives and really challenge ourselves individually to evaluate and say, man, am I being someone that includes others or am I excluding people? Am I making people feel like they don't belong? We want to be like the Acts 2 church. So a couple ways that we try to be like the Acts 2 church. We try not to just sit around in a room on Wednesday nights and just attend. We wanna go and be the church. So that's why we go to Mexico. That's why we go to Open Door Mission. That's why we try to encourage our small groups to say, hey, find ways to serve in the community. You know, look at Fremont, look for a way to go and serve there. Even if it's just raking up people's yards. Find a way to serve and love people together. That's when we become most alive in our faith, when we stop sitting and we start going. I know for me, I can look back at my life and I can look at certain points and I know exactly the times where I felt most alive in my life. There were times when I went the extra mile to serve, when I went the extra mile to try and live like Jesus and die to myself and live for him. I remember one summer, I was at kind of a low point in my life, but I went on this mission trip to Africa. And I didn't really feel like going the week before. I was just kind of in this dark place. But when I was there, living beyond my selfish desires and everything I wanted to do in life, that was when I, that's when I truly came alive in my faith. When you go and serve and you go and live to help others more than you're trying to live for yourself, 
That's when you come alive the way Jesus intends us to come alive. The Holy Spirit wants us to live that way. When talking about the Holy Spirit and how he changes us and how he moves us, I want you to hear this verse tonight. It's in Galatians chapter five. Let me read it for you. This is how the church, the people, how we should listen to the Spirit and how we should live. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil. I mean, really, it does. You know, naturally, we want to do evil in life, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of the sinful nature's desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. I know I've felt that in my life, and I guarantee most of you in here have felt that at some point. You knew something was wrong, but you knew, oh, I, I want to do it, but I, I know I shouldn't. And, and those two forces are fighting against each other inside of you. So you're not free to carry out your good intentions, but when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. And I want you to listen to this tonight. This is called the fruit of the Spirit. And I want you to pick out one of these fruits of the Spirit that you can feel God is calling you tonight to work on in your own life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. This is what the Holy Spirit is guiding you towards tonight, these things. I would challenge you to write this verse down, Galatians 5, verse 16 through 26. Read through that section of Scripture and read over specifically the fruits of the Spirit. And ask God to speak into your life. What does he want you to hear? How does he want you to live? Last story I want to tell you tonight. Uh, I told you that sometimes we struggle to hear God. And we struggle with faith because, I mean, really, if we're being honest, we want to have a moment like Moses had. We want to see God in a burning bush. We want to hear his voice audibly. But I'm guessing none of us have ever had that moment. But that's what we want. If we could just have that, then we would know God is real and then we could hear him and know what he wants us to do. But I'm telling you tonight, I want you to hear this story. There's this preacher, his name is Erwin McManus. And he talks about his son a few years back in this story. And he said his son was about 10 or 12, right around that age, and he was going to summer camp. And the week before he was going to summer camp, he asked his dad, a preacher, he said, Dad, how do I hear God? I, I just want to hear his voice. Because, I, you know, he'd heard in church growing up, people, they, they had had these moments where they said, oh, I, I heard God speak to me. And he told his dad, I want God to speak to me. And Erwin, he didn't really have a good answer for him at the time. And so, you know, he ended up going to summer camp. And, and a couple days into camp, Erwin gets a call that his son had gotten into a fight out at camp. And Erwin, he drives out there. They want him to come pick his son up and take him back. It was a pretty bad fight. And, you know, he gets there and he sits down with his son. And he just asks him, you know, why'd you do this? What what were you thinking? He says, I I don't know. This kid was just making fun of me and he kept talking and talking Finally, I just punched him in the nose. And Erwin said, well, did you break his nose? Yeah. He's like, well, good punch. That's a good punch. No, he didn't say that. He said, 
now that it's all, all over, did you know in the moment that what you were doing was wrong? And his son looked at him and said, yeah, I just, I felt it. I knew it was wrong. I knew I shouldn't do it. I knew I should walk away. And Erwin said, son, that was God speaking to you. I know you feel like God hasn't spoken to you in your life, but he speaks in ways that we cannot understand. But he is there. He, he is nudging us along through people around us, through experiences, through his word. Man, if you wanna hear God speak, open up the Bible. That's what this whole series has been about. If you open up God's word, they are his words. That is him speaking and you will feel the spirit convicting you, nudging you to change, to become more like Jesus. Here's what I know Jesus wants us to do. He wants us to stop sitting in a room and start going to be the church. He wants us to go and serve. He wants us to go and love. He wants us to be kind to that kid that nobody is kind to. He wants us to invite that kid that everyone knows doesn't believe in God, is an atheist or whatever, to go invite them to church with you, to go tell them about Jesus and what he has done in your life. God is nudging you tonight. He is putting something on your heart and I want you to take a moment during this next song of worship to sit in the quiet and listen to his voice. What is he speaking into your life tonight? You're not gonna hear audible words. You're not gonna see a burning bush, but you're gonna feel it. And you're gonna know he's convicting you. He's speaking to you. Let's pray. God, help us to hear your voice. Help us to find moments in our lives where we sit in the quiet and we listen, where we open up scripture and we just ask you to make something pop out of that page to us. God, help us to find moments where we read through the fruits of the Spirit, and we just ask you, God, in those moments, show us which one of the fruits that you're calling us to work on. Show us how we can live out love or gentleness or kindness. God, help us to hear you tonight. What's that next step that you're nudging us towards? To go and serve in Mexico, to go and serve at Open Door Mission, to go invite that kid down the street that has nobody in their life that cares for him, to come and belong to your church. God, speak, us, speak to us tonight. In him, pray. Amen.